Paper Mario, the Origami King, isn't the immediate return to form many were expecting with the series, but that's okay. It's a step in the right direction, with witty writing and great gameplay. Honestly, the people that bash this game are clearly just whiners that can't get over their thousand year door nostalgia. <gasps> oh, I just had a terrible dream. I was a liar. I don't like this game. I really don't. I can't say that it's the worst game ever, or even that it's objectively bad, but in terms of games that I just personally resent, this one's up there. And I could jump right into the reasons for that, but I think when it comes to talking about the pitfalls of not just this game, but modern Paper Mario in general, context is everything. So if you'll bear with me for a bit, I'd like to start that journey from the beginning. Oh, I don't own an actual Super Nintendo? Why did you think I would? Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars is considered an absolute cult classic nowadays. But this must have been a weird concept at the time, right? Think about it. At this point, during the 16-bit era, the role-playing game genre was pretty much entirely known for slower-paced strategic gameplay and dramatic, bloodshed-filled stories within sword and sorcery fantasy worlds. Magic myth! There were games that challenged that stereotype for sure, but that sort of thing was still what an RPG was to most audiences. And that is a far cry from the pick-up-and-play, light-hearted action games of the Super Mario series. These concerns were certainly not lost on Nintendo or their collaborators over at Square, creators of the Final Fantasy series. Both parties really wanted to make a Mario RPG work. After all, it had the potential to extend the Mario brand even further, and ease younger, Western players into the genre, but they knew you couldn't just haphazardly slap Mario onto the Final Fantasy formula. Well, the team behind Super Mario RPG made plenty of smart decisions. First of all, the attack options were nothing like that of Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. They didn't just shove a medieval sword into Mario's hands. Sega does what Nintendo don't. Instead, for the most part, the main cast uses a variety of weapons, spells, and special moves befitting the franchise. For example, Mario himself uses stomps, fireballs, and even a hammer inspired by his debut in Donkey Kong. On the topic of combat, while at its core the battle system is pretty standard turn-based fare, a big twist was added to bridge the gap between that and Mario's platforming routes. Action commands. Whenever you perform an attack, you can time a button press just right to boost its power. Not only does this rhythm-esque mechanic inject a bit of the Super Mario series reflex-based action into a turn-based system, but it also makes the game a bit more accessible to newcomers. That injection of action extends outside of combat too. Instead of the usual top-down grid-based movement that boils down to Super Mario RPG uses an isometric perspective that simulates 3D and allows Mario to run and jump in all directions. This opens the door for some platforming challenges, minigames, and even the ability to choose to confront or avoid enemies, as opposed to random encounters, which were far more common at the time. All of these things were brilliant decisions, evidenced by the fact that they became standard in future games. But in my opinion, the best and most important thing Super Mario RPG did was expand upon the Mario universe as a fleshed out fictional world. No longer was the Mushroom Kingdom merely a series of abstract obstacle courses tied together by a paper thin <laughs> damsel in distress plot that serves little purpose outside of quickly explaining why you're going through the obstacle courses. Super Mario RPG gave this franchise a much more in-depth plot, improved characterization, and above all else, world building. This version of Mario's home is an actual lived-in place, with memorable geography, societies, cultures, and lore, all existing within a cohesive, interconnected world. It all sounds so basic in the grand scheme of things, but again, having something like this for Super Mario, a franchise notorious for being light on all of the above, that's special. Add on top of that a host of brand new characters and concepts that make the world feel even bigger. <laughs> and Super Mario RPG was a success, not just critically, but kind of surprisingly. 
commercially. It sold pretty damn well, at the very least surpassing Nintendo's expectations. And it was clear that Nintendo was happy with the game, because when the SNES was out and the Nintendo 64 was in, there was a desire to get a successor off the ground. Yes, there was work to get a follow-up to Super Mario RPG on the N64. At the same time, developers at Nintendo were looking to experiment with different types of 3D graphics, namely displaying 2D sprites within a 3D environment a la Parappa the Rapper. That graphical style seemed to be a great fit for this new RPG, especially with the characters redesigned to resemble classic cartoons. During development, the project was simply called Super Mario RPG 2, but apparently Square still owned the rights to the Super Mario RPG name and original characters, something we're still seeing the consequences of to this day. So in Japan, it was given a new name inspired by its pop-up book aesthetic and emphasis on narrative, Mario Story. But in the West, it was given a completely different name based on its art style, Paper Mario. The original Paper Mario is an absolute joy. Not only did it carry on the ingenious blending of classic yeah! with turn-based RPG goodness, platformer-like movement in the field, the action commands in battle, but vitally, it continued to expand upon all that plot, characterization, and world building. Mario's partners, the party members of this game, are a perfect representation of that. Each of these partners is a unique take on what had previously been a mere generic enemy. I point this out because it's a good sample of what Super Mario RPG had started to do to a certain extent, but the Paper Mario games would really run with with. Transforming these creatures that had only been seen as endlessly duplicated platforming obstacles into full-fledged fantasy races with their own civilizations and cultures from which we get memorable individual characters. And of course, the world itself is also just as, if not more fleshed out than that of the previous game. Taking a lot of the typical level themes seen in mainline Mario and turning them into lived-in places with an interconnected setting, while also sprinkling in completely new concepts. Once again, I will reiterate, all this stuff seems pretty basic, but it's special for this franchise. It says a lot when the main plot boils down to the standard Bowser kidnaps Peach song and dance, but all of the other details make it feel so much more substantial. The Mario universe now feels like a true world. And in all of those aspects, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door on the GameCube is the perfect sequel. Not only does it continue to expand upon recognizable races, but it introduces completely new ones to the fold, which not only allows for cool new character designs, but makes the Super Mario world feel even bigger. And the world itself is bigger. Mario and his pals travel outside of the familiar Mushroom Kingdom to confront a never-before-seen threat. Locations like Rogueport, Boggly Woods, and Twilight Town strike a great balance between being very different from the standard Mario fare, while still believably existing within the same realm as, say, Toad Town or Yoshi's Island. Gameplay-wise, it's mostly just an enhanced version of the N64 game, but there is a big addition in the form of paper-themed abilities in the field. As it turns Turns out, some Western players were disappointed that a game called Paper Mario didn't really take advantage of that adjective. Of course, as I said before, the Paper Mario title was a product of localization, but the devs still took notice. Not only did the title make its way back to Japan, but they threw in these new traversal techniques as a compromise. And again, a great balance was struck. These abilities give a nod towards the series title while still remaining a stylistic decision. It's not like the idea of the characters being paper became the whole point of the game, overtaking and hindering all the other elements that make the series special. Oh look, a foreshadow. All in all, there's a reason why people love the Thousand Year Door. It's everything a Mario RPG should be. Fun and accessible RPG gameplay, yes, but once more, I will stress that the most important thing is plot, characterization, and world building. And I didn't even mention that a sister series, Mario and Luigi, had started up around this time, also following in the footsteps of Super Mario RPG, but with its own ideas and identity that made it distinct from Paper Mario. Yes, across the board, it was a great time to be a fan of this sort of thing.
Then we come to Super Paper Mario on the Wii. This one's pretty divisive, mostly due to a drastic change in gameplay. Now, instead of a turn-based RPG with platformer elements, it's a platformer with RPG elements. But personally, in spite of how big of a change this is and the new gameplay's numerous flaws, I still love this game. The gameplay is still fun, and the series still maintains its emphasis on, say it with me, plot, characterization, and world world building. Now we're expanding even further out of the Mario comfort zone, hopping between entire dimensions, each one extremely different from the last. Plus the overarching story is about forbidden love and the inevitability of death. Good luck getting that out of Super Mario Advance 4 Super Mario Bros. 3. If anything, I think this game showed that they can make big changes to the Paper Mario formula without sacrificing what truly makes the series special. Notice how I said can, not will. Yeah, around this time, the Super Mario franchise entered a rather… stagnant era. See, New Super Mario Bros. had been a massive success and was already spawning sequels, and those games were defined by returning to Mario's 2D platformer roots and being… really bland. In my award-winning Mario Kart video, I coined the term promotional poster ass, which I used as shorthand for this franchise's annoying tendency to stick with the same old same old. The designated Mario cast in their designated roles, vague classic set pieces and a sterile presentation, all reeking of restrictive mandates and corporate synergy. This kicked off in the DS and Wii era, so it was clear Nintendo was doing all of this in order to appeal to the casual, mainstream audience. Despite the fact that I don't think being a bit more experimental and interesting would drive those casuals away as long as the game is still accessible and Mario is still on the cover. But that was their mentality. That blandness emerged from New Super Mario Bros. and slowly influenced every other branch of the franchise, including the series where that sort of thing really hurts. Paper Mario Sticker Star released on the Nintendo 3DS in 2012. I can just leave it at that, but I guess I'll say a bit more. Sticker Star brought back turn-based combat, and it's not good, but we'll get to that. Other than that, they just stripped away everything that was special about the series. Locations that either take a familiar level theme and turn it into something more lived in and unique, or just introduce a new concept entirely? Nope, now we have levels that are as generic and lifeless as in New Super Mario Bros. Recognizable Mario creatures turned into proper races with a variety of designs and personalities as well as brand new species? Nah, we only got nameless and essentially faceless toads, Goombas, Koopas, and whatnot, all presented exactly exactly how they would be in New Super Mario Bros. A surprisingly interesting plot to tie it all together. The bulk of the story is an intro cutscene with no dialogue where Bowser ruins everything and go stop him! Now what does that remind me of New Super Mario Bros.? Remember plot, characterization, and world building? No you don't. On top of that, they put way bigger emphasis on the whole paper thing, and that has turned out to be a bit of a bother for reasons that, again, we will get into. I'm choosing not to dive into too much detail about any of this right now, because I'm saving it for our main event, where unfortunately most of my complaints still apply. But first we have to go through this thing. Paper Mario Color Splash, released on the Wii U in 2016, sure is a sticker star sequel. It was the Wii U era, Nintendo was at the peak of their chronic tone deafness, so it's no surprise they doubled down on pretty much everything wrong with Sticker Star. Something that was immediately apparent from how the announcement was received, yeesh! And hey, the gameplay is worse because they did the Wii U thing where they tried and failed to justify the gamepad's existence by forcing a really annoying and unnecessary control scheme that does nothing but add extra steps, and solve problems that never existed. Though, obviously, the elephant in the room is that the golden trio is still as bland as could be. I should note that, with this game, a lot of people will say that once you give it a chance, the writing's actually pretty good. It's witty. Put a pin in that. But not for very long, because now we're jumping to the Nintendo Switch. Going into 2020, and that on its own should be seen as a grim omen, there were rumors that a new Paper Mario game was in the works, and that it'd be a long-awaited return to form for the series. And honestly, that 
wasn't hard to believe at the time. Especially in the first few years of the Switch's life, Nintendo was doing that sort of thing left and right. Mario and Zelda had big bombastic new entries that challenged series conventions and addressed fan demands. Mario Party ditched the stupid car. Metroid was revived. So maybe, just maybe, that same thing could happen with Paper Mario. Well, right on cue, in May of 2020, Nintendo suddenly released a trailer for the next Paper Mario game and damn it. Well, at least we still have Mario and Luigi. F Listen, I know a lot of people immediately reacted to this trailer saying it seemed to be a step in the right direction, but I just didn't see it. There was some neat stuff in there, but overall, it absolutely looked like it was going to have nearly all of the same issues as the previous two entries. And then it released, and... yeah... I realize I'm punching up a bit here. This game reviewed very well overall, with critics praising the gameplay, presentation, and yes, the writing. Also, people in general seem to like this game and defend it way more than Sticker Star or Color Splash. But... I'm sorry, Paper Mario the Origami King is just endlessly frustrating to me. It carries forward all of the things that bother me about those two other games, but it's the third entry now, so it's honestly even more irritating. But hey, I think I've done enough context and overview. Everyone who would get angry at this has already commented and clicked off. So let's dive into the Origami King and use it to discuss why I find modern Paper Mario... insulting. Might as well explain the premise first, even though I don't know why you'd be here unless you were at least decent familiar with the game I'm talking about. Paper Mario The Origami King opens with Mario and Luigi making their way to Toad Town to celebrate the so-called Origami Festival, only to find the town completely abandoned. Upon further inspection, they find that the denizens of the Mushroom Kingdom, including Princess Peach, have been turned into folded monsters by Ollie, the titular Origami King. When Ollie then steals the entire castle away, somebody needs to bolt that thing down, Mario must work with Ollie's sister Olivia in order to take him down and save the day. Hooray! As much as explaining that makes me really want to go right into bitching about writing mode, I'll start off easy with the gameplay, which is… fine… it's fine. Sticker Star and Color Splash both played pretty abhorrently, specifically in their main combat systems. In comparison, the Origami King's combat is not only distinct, but far more competent. Not having every attack option be disposable will do that. Here, it's still ostensibly a turn-based battle system, but it's really more of a mini-puzzle game than anything. Mario is surrounded by rings, and you have to rotate those rings in order to line up the enemies for his attacks, with an optimal lineup not only allowing him to attack as many enemies as possible, but also granting him a buff to his power. Different types of attacks have different ranges, not all attacks affect all enemy types, and the varied enemy combinations and layouts can mix up the strategy for both arranging and attacking. When I explain it like that, it does sound pretty cool. And like I said, it's fine, it gets the job done, but I still don't find it particularly fun or worthwhile. First off, the whole rotating puzzle part of it. It is a cool idea, but it just ends up becoming so tediously repetitive. There are only so many enemy lineups and positions in any given area, so you're gonna end up having to repeat the same ring moves over and over again. And of course, once you solve a puzzle, it's solved. This puzzle system is really basic too, with not many factors to be remixed and recontextualized over time, so you really are going to be doing the same simple thing over and over, and it stops being satisfying fast. And some people might say, oh, well, doesn't that apply to most turn-based games? They usually have a few set enemy encounters for each area, and if a dominant strategy prevails, you'll probably take out the same enemy lineup the same way each time. Sure, to a certain extent that's valid, but in most of those cases, while a lot of players will just favor repeating the highest DPS options, the gameplay isn't so restrictive that this approach is the only viable option. In The Origami King, solving these puzzles the one correct way is pretty much the only viable option. The ability to attack all foes in one go, and especially that power buff, make all the difference in the world. It's clear they bounce the battles around that rather than Mario's base power, which would be fine if it weren't such a repetitive slog to get to that point for every battle. And other than the fact that each puzzle only has one solution and that solution is repeated over and over, the reason it's such a slog is that it takes so long. 
in a good turn-based system, things are snappy, so even if your actions are repetitive, they don't waste your time. With the Origami King, just the fact that you have to look at the board, take a moment to process what you're dealing with, rotate some circles, switch modes to push some rows, rotate some more circles, then select an attack, and then input the action commands. It doesn't take a huge amount of time on its own, but with how many times you'll be going through this process in a playthrough, it adds up fast, to the point where I kind of wish this was just regular turn-based combat. So while this is certainly more functional and inspired than the previous two combat systems, it still suffers from the same issue of feeling like old Paper Mario combat with a bunch of annoying, unnecessary steps. And then the boss battle system is an entirely separate thing that is outright awful. You still have to rotate and push rings, but now the goal is to make your way inward towards an action panel, picking up items and buffs along the way. Again, theoretically interesting, but it's even more of a slog than the normal encounters, and there's so much f***ing trial and error. A little bit of that is fine for this kind of game. Fishing for weaknesses is a staple of RPG combat, but you have to commit so much time and energy to making even a single move here, that if it turns out that the enemy is immune to that particular action, despite there being no way for you to have known that going into it? Yeah, this sucks! And with how much health these bosses have, you're gonna have to go through this process over, and over, and over, and over. Once again, it over, feels like a traditional combat over, system with over, extra unnecessary and, over, and unfun and steps. Over and over. Speaking of gameplay issues carried on from the previous two entries, let's talk about a big point of contention, the lack of experience points. Just like before, the only real reward you get for battling are coins. And I'm just gonna say it, this has been a fundamentally stupid idea since Sticker Star, and it's still bad. It's genuinely baffling that this is stuck for three games in a row now, considering how poorly designed it is. No real experience points and only getting coins that you can use to buy things like items and equipment would potentially be fine, except the game constantly showers you in coins outside of battle. Like, you can avoid normal encounters just getting coins from the field and scripted battles, and you will not be strapped for cash because holy sh**. So what is the incentive for fighting normal enemies? Is there not supposed to be? Are normal encounters supposed to be a punishment? Is the battle system tedious on purpose? Almost definitely not, but this is so befuddling that you can almost believe it. Who in their right mind would design a game like this without any real reason to actually engage in combat except when the game literally forces you into it? Actually, I managed to get my hands on a 2D Mario level from the creators of the Origami King. Broke new ground! According to producer Kensuke Tanabe, a lot of these design decisions were made in order to appease fans who enjoyed the older RPG combat, while not alienating the casual audience. Yeah, sure, this is too confusing for your uncle, but this makes perfect sense to him. As messy as the attempt was, it is clear as day that they were trying to have their cake and eat it too. Being able to say, look, turn-based combat, while making it arbitrarily unique and non-essential enough to not really feel like a proper RPG. They clearly went for one of my biggest peeves in game design, prioritizing being unique over being good. And at that point, I just think, I don't know, maybe they shouldn't have even bothered. Maybe they should have just made it a straight up action puzzle game. That would have rubbed some older fans the wrong way, but for one, this already doesn't resemble the old games, and like I said, that original gameplay was never what defined the series for me. So why not just go all in on real-time action, rather than half-assing turn-based combat and throwing in all these clunky bells and whistles? Well, on that note, let's talk about the gameplay outside the core battle system. Honestly, it's better than combat. I mean, okay, it's more or less the same as any other Paper Mario game, Super notwithstanding. But that also means it's pretty alright. Running, jumping, swinging your hammer, all to proceed through the world or complete various challenges or brain teasers, many of which this time revolve around finding toads. And for the record, I do like the whole toad rescue thing, building Toad Town's population back up and sometimes opening a new shop. That's a neat, charming progression system. 
What I'm not so into is that for many of these puzzles, the solution is just hit everything in sight with your hammer until something happens. Fine, I guess, but it gets brain numbing when combined with the equally lackluster puzzles of combat. Imagine a game like Portal, but instead of each chamber being, you know, unique and good, each one is just the equivalent of the tutorial where it's just stuff like put the box on the button and then move on, and they're all repeated several times over. And then between each chamber, you have shorter puzzles where it's not really a puzzle because the solution is just press the interact button on every inch of the map until a door opens. Paper Mario the Origami King. Oh, and I didn't even mention the Thousand Fold Arms or Confetti. They're both treated like big new additions, but they're both very much nothing. The Thousand Fold Arms is a thing you interact with sometimes, and it's always just find the rumble, or worse, mash the button, and that's it. And then the confetti is a consumable item that you use to fill up gaps in the level. And there's no thought to it if you see a hole, spam the trigger. You don't even need to do any resource management with it. Hitting just about anything with the hammer will give you an infinite amount of the stuff. Both of these mechanics are pretty mindless and feel like they were only added in order to put something wacky on the back of the box. Kids love accordion arms, it's genius. Well, when my way of starting off easy is saying this video game isn't very fun to play, that's not a good sign. But as many problems as I have with the gameplay, it of course isn't the reason why I resent the Origami King or find Modern Paper Mario to be so frustrating. So let's get into that. It'll be... fun? Remember how I said that sticker stars drift away all the unique characters and world building and Color Splash more or less kept that up? Well... To be fair to the Origami King, it at least gives us a new main antagonist, and an inciting incident that isn't just Bowser having a fun day at Hobby Lobby. <sighs> After all, this entry sure has mastered the art of pretending to give people like me what they want, but otherwise, all the worst tendencies of modern Paper Mario have not budged. And right off the bat, I want to address the whole, these games have really good witty writing if you give them a chance. I will admit, there are a handful of little character interactions that I find funny, cute or charming, but that stuff still feels lackluster because it's all the game's got. The older games had the witty moments on top of everything else. The way the older games handled the familiar Mario creatures, locations, and original editions are just slipping further and further away. We get glimpses of, like, cultures and civilizations and stuff. The Koopas worshipping the Earth Valumental or Shroom City in general come to mind, but that sort of thing is barely there. Mostly feeling like slapping standard Mario allies and enemies around rather than trying to turn them into fleshed out fantasy races like before. For the most part, those races are now presented in the most uninspired light. Toads are Mario's trusted allies, but it's implied that the only reason all the other guys aren't acting as villainous goons is because of the bigger threat. Sure, that's how Super Mario RPG handled it, more or less, but even by the first Paper Mario, we had moved on to something far more interesting. Interesting. In conjunction with that, individual members of these races no longer have unique designs for the most part, only ever appearing in their most generic forms and their names follow suit. Look, it's the amazing character, Babam, and all the toads named Toad. You know how I was harping on about how the classic Paper Mario games carved out a niche for themselves by taking these established parts of the Mario brand, sprinkling in some new original concepts, and carefully rearranging and remixing it all into a level of narrative and lore that felt so fresh for that franchise, making Mario's universe feel like, you know, an actual complex place? Because of this bullshit that's been carried on since Sticker Star, we don't get that anymore. To me, at least, this no longer feels as much like a lived-in world with a host of diverse communities and characters that all have their own stories. It feels like, well, a game where the player is just moving on from one set piece to the next, with none of it really inspiring the imagination by making the Mario universe seem big and alive. And judging by certain statements by a certain producer, that was absolutely the intention. And this is as good a time as any to mention that quote. In an interview with VGC, our old pal Kensuke Tanabe said, and I quote, Since Paper Mario Sticker Star, it's no longer possible to modify Mario characters or create original characters that touch on the Mario universe. You can read the rest of that quote, as well as a couple other relevant mentions of supposed restrictions on screen. But long story short, according to Tanabe, the reason why things have been so bland since Sticker Star is that the 
powers that be aren't allowing them to create unique spins on known creatures like Koops, or characters that belong to brand new races that exist within the world like Vivian. Any new characters have to be crafts theme entities completely foreign to the Mario universe, like Ollie and Olivia, or purposefully mundane office supplies. They can't add on to the world building of the universe itself. Whenever people lament the loss of what the older games had, I always see defenders of the modern games point out this interview as proof that the devs' hands are tied, and this is the best they can do. But honestly, this has never felt quite right to me. These supposed mandates don't seem to affect series other than Paper Mario. Take Super Mario Odyssey for example, which was released between Color Splash and the Origami King. A mainline Mario game that introduced a plethora of brand new races, unique takes on pre-existing creatures, and distinct locations with their own civilizations, all of which were positioned as genuine parts of Mario's world. We can also look at the Super Mario Bros. movie. As an adaptation, it's more conservative when it comes to introducing completely new content concepts, but it still has unique individual takes on established races like Koopas and Kongs, and takes liberties in contextualizing a whole bunch of familiar Mario elements within an interconnected world. Hell, the rule doesn't even appear to be totally set in stone for Paper Mario either. The exceptions are very minimal, again only pretending to give people what they want, but they are there and do raise some more questions. Isn't it a little weird that two incredibly mainstream projects, the next big system selling Mario game and a western created film are able to do these things, but the niche RPG series that used to be known for it just can't, except when it sometimes can. I'm not saying for certain that Kensuke Tanabe is lying to us about the restrictions placed on modern Paper Mario games. What I am saying is that there are two possibilities. Either the mandates are as real and strict as he says, and they're just stupidly selective, or this is some deceptive damage control. The mandates aren't so strict, or maybe don't even really exist, and the whole thing's an excuse for Paper Mario losing just about everything that made it special. To be clear, I could see either of these being the case, and whichever is true, I don't like it. Whether higher-ups have truly forced these changes, or there's more to the story, it's a baffling and outright bad decision to prohibit Paper Mario from delving into the very things that made it interesting in the first place. Even if you don't hate modern Paper Mario, even if you're a fan of the Origami King, do you really think the series is better off not having this? Or this? Or this? But of course, they don't want you to think any of that was what defined Paper Mario. They want you to believe that the whole point of this series is that it's PAPER! Look, I'm not necessarily opposed to the series more heavily playing into the whole crafts thing. And in the Origami King especially, it is visually stunning. But by and large, the way the modern games have gone about this new direction... <sighs> It is constantly shoved in your face, not just through the visuals, but through the writing. Characters constantly refer to being crumpled, folded, and waterlogged, not just as wordplay, but as legitimate in-universe concerns. The antagonistic threats of the past three games only function within the context that everything in this world is an arts and crafts project. The Origami King's first major boss is a fucking pencil case. Now. I have my preferences. I did prefer the more understated approach of the older games, where the paper mostly referred to the storybook aesthetic and the occasional gameplay mechanic that didn't have major implications on the story and world. I did prefer when not every plot element pretty much had to tie back into the arts and crafts theming, usually just for some dumb joke in order to justify the premise. I did prefer when I could imagine all these characters, locales, and storylines coexisting with the more traditional Mario games games, the idea that the Paper Mario series could actually expand upon the franchise as a whole, and not just be its own self-contained entity. I emphasize preference with all that, because I don't expect that many people to agree with those points. Even with a series more focused on writing, not everyone is going to care so much about the weight of the narrative or how it can tie into the Mario War. Fair enough. But honestly, I think the biggest issue with it is that this newer presentation completely consumed the series' identity in a way that has sown complacency. You can see that in yet another Kensuke Tanabe quote. The Paper Mario series is all about paper. <laughs> no, it's not, my guy. Or at least, it wasn't before 2012. 
But since then, the insistence that being paper is the main point of the series has become a crutch. The novelty of these games comes from reimagining stock standard Super Mario elements as arts and crafts junk. We don't need to implement any interesting plot, characterization, and world building, because the fact that everything is paper is enough of a hook on its own. Just pick another crafty thing out of a hat and that's the crux of the next game. It's made the creative process of these game stories so by the numbers, seemingly leading the creators to rest on their laurels. Before I move on to my closing statements, I'm a lawyer now. I want to take a moment to address possible responses to the things I've brought up. Might be a good way to sum up my thoughts more concisely as we get out of here. I've seen enough Paper Mario discourse to know some of the more common talking points. And by the by, please don't turn the comment section into a war zone. It's not that serious, fellas. Number one, you're blinded by thousand year door nostalgia and don't like change. Well, I already said that I really like Super Paper Mario, and as we've established, that was a huge change from the previous games. It's not that I don't like change, it's that I don't like a series becoming less interesting. And worse. Number two, the Origami King is a step in the right direction. Sure, it's a substantial improvement from Sticker Star and Color Splash, but that really isn't saying much. It sure was nice of that serial killer to murder slightly less people this week. There are additions that are supposed to address people's complaints about the previous titles, but again, they feel like the absolute bare minimum. Just smoke and mirrors to convince people that they're trying their darndest. Number three, the Origami King has good writing when you give it a chance. I'm not about to say this game has outright bad writing, but like I said, Outside of witty and cute moments, there's not much there compared to the older games. Again, very much an intentional decision on behalf of the creators, and I don't like it. Not only does it come off as sort of shallow in its own right, but when the game does suddenly try to have some sort of touching or tragic moment with its characters, it doesn't work that well because of all of the other elements, like comedy being put before anything else at every turn, the intrusive usage of the paper gimmick, and the deliberate lack of distinct characters. I'm Sorry, but the dissonance can sometimes be outright laughable. Number 4. The gameplay story and presentation changes were made to differentiate Paper Mario from Mario and Luigi. Well, that sure worked out for them, didn't it? Paper Mario and Mario and Luigi were already distinct beyond the surface, but they made arbitrary and mostly harmful changes to the former, just to make the difference more apparent to people who knew nothing about either. And now with Mario and Luigi dead in the water as far as we know, there's nowhere to go to get something resembling the old style of this series. Unless... Number 5. Just go play Bug Fables! Ah yes, I see this one all the time. Bug Fables is a spiritual successor to the Thousand Year Door, so you could go to that for your fix. The problem is, in case I haven't made it clear already, being a fun RPG with action mechanics, a unique art style, and good writing isn't necessarily what made those older games special. Even putting Bug Fables aside, there are plenty of other games that accomplish all of those things and more. You know what those games don't have? This guy! What made Paper Mario special was that it had all of that good stuff for the Mario franchise, an IP that normally didn't have any of those things, especially in the writing department. That was what defined the series before they tried to gaslight us into thinking the point of the series was the chance to see a paper mache Goomba and that's it. And that sort of thing is what ties into my extreme negativity surrounding these recent games. When I say that modern Paper Mario is insulting, or that I resent the Origami King specifically, it's not necessarily about the quality of the games themselves, or even my desire for the old style to return. It's about what all of these problems represent. Game design that's more concerned with being unique than being fun or coherent. Degrading a series identity and best attributes in a misguided chase of mainstream appeal and brand synergy. Being vocal and almost proud of strict mandates and creative bankruptcy, even when claims of restriction are contradicted elsewhere. Conducting weird Nintendo psyops to convince people that the series has always been this way. The Thousand Year Door never happened, look at these new innovations of ours! You know, the environments are connected organically into this big world to explore. 
uh, which is which is one of the new things about this game that I really love. The way they've slowly trinkled in extremely surface level versions of beloved components of the older games as an illusion that they're taking a step in the right direction. The fact that we're three games into this new era and they show nothing but stubbornness in getting off of the dull path set by Sticker Star. Above all else, that's why the Origami King is my least favorite in the series. With Sticker Star, they went blindly into something new which ultimately failed. With Color Splash, they doubled down on the previous game's worst tendencies, but that was almost expected in that era, which was just a bad time for Nintendo all around. The Origami King has no such excuse. We are three games in. The latest entry was released at a time when a bunch of other series were returning to form or getting a new lease on life. Tanabe and others have acknowledged people's criticisms of modern Paper Mario. They have every reason to know better and change for the better. And yet, things are more or less the same, with the only difference being those surface level additions, obnoxious gameplay mechanics, and witty moments that serve little purpose outside of reminding us of better times and giving this game's weirdly defensive fanbase something to latch onto. The Origami King is far from a bad game on its own, and it's not even the worst Paper Mario game in the series from an objective standpoint, but with all of this context, I find it to be a terribly annoying release, enough to be one of my personal least favorites of all time. And you want to know the best part? I'm not so sure it matters anymore. Can I level with you guys a bit? <sighs> Talking about why I dislike this game just stopped being fun for me. If anything, it actually began to burn me out. And looking at what I mentioned before, with other branches of the Super Mario franchise getting a little bit of the magic that made old Paper Mario special, I'm wondering if it's even worth getting upset about the series' current direction. Don't get me wrong, that other stuff doesn't match what 64, The Thousand Year Door, or Super had just yet. And even if it did, I'm never gonna be okay with a series I love becoming worse for no good reason, but... I don't know. If the rest of the Super Mario franchise continues to up their game with... <gasps> Maybe this won't matter. And I don't know how to feel about that. And then while I was editing this video, Nintendo announced the Super Mario RPG remake. Holy sh**! What? Okay. Cool. Please let this be a sign of things to come. Please, please, please!